Good morning, everyone of you. So today we are in the session Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights. And as you know, this is a very important topic, uh, given the extraordinary role of human rights as a normative principle uh, within ethics, also given the rising discourse on uh, human rights and the responsibility of enterprises. Uh, so we are not just looking at uh, the question of human rights here from, I would say, a pu purely technological point of view, but we are also having, I would say, uh, the perspective of the responsibilities of companies. Uh, so here we are basically in a panel connecting to some extent technology and human rights, but also in another extent, uh, the responsibility of enterprises and the question of human rights. And to this end, uh, we have a panel consisting of, uh, I would say, different experts in, in different fields of the debate. And I will also make some remarks on that so that you as participants uh, feel also to some extent uh, knowledgeable about how basically about which com uh, topics we are about to cover. And uh, one important point is here um, that uh, we look uh, also from an intercultural perspective on uh, the phenomenon of uh, human rights. Uh, so Lord will uh, later make a presentation about uh, the question of interpreting uh, human rights, but also the ethical implications of artificial intelligence from an African uh, perspective. And I think this is very valuable because given the fact that uh, human rights approaches are traditionally based in the West, it is very important when applying those concepts also to look at traditional ethical approaches from other uh, regions of the world. So we are very uh, thankful a lot that you will give a presentation on uh, this topic as well. When we look at human rights, we have also very close uh, interrelation uh, between the concept of human rights and equality. And equality is, of course, a major topic, uh, I would say, which is determining also the entire discourse on anti-discrimination and uh, diversity. And one specific field uh, where uh, discrimination is extremely important is, of course, uh, the area of recruiting. Uh, so Anna will uh, introduce us to the topic of AI recruiting and the question of human rights. And as we will see, um, there is also not just a discourse about discrimination uh, and uh, recruiting, but also discourse on um, AI recruiting and uh, data privacy, which is quite important uh, to mention. Um, Raphael is also adding up uh, to this uh, context because Raphael is not uh, giving a presentation which is focusing on AI in specific, but rather on uh, bias and discrimination. And the topic of bias and discrimination is very important because today we have, I would say, very strong debates on uh, bias based on uh, gender. We have a very strong debate on uh, bias and uh, on the other side, uh, race, for example. But uh, we tend right now also to overlook traditional biases we might have in specific uh, business sectors. Uh, so this applies, for example, uh, when it comes to anti-Semitic stereotypes in the financial industry. Uh, so Rafael will uh, guide us, uh, I think, to this very interesting topic and also analyze that those kind of stereotypes when it comes to the classification of investment decisions uh, really matter. Uh, and that also one criterion for judging human beings apparently uh, seems to be uh, whether the name is uh, has a certain background or not. Uh, so I think this is quite important, also given uh, the right now um, prevailing discourse on uh, discrimination. Um, Nikita is also uh, giving us insights uh, from a Russian perspective uh, to the AI ethics discourse, especially when it comes to uh, public uh, discrimination. There is also a longer story attached to that. Uh, so I have been collaborating with uh, Professor uh, Kamolov from uh, MGIMO, which is a leading university in Russia when it comes to international affairs. And uh, Nikita also working at uh, the MGIMO Faculty for Public Administration and working closely together with uh, Professor Kamolov is then giving us insights in also the fields of public administration. So as you can see, we have uh, quite a diverse array of topics. And uh, as the saying goes, ladies first, I want uh, to give Anna the opportunity to start her interesting presentation on AI, human rights, and recruiting. So the floor is yours. Yes, thanks, Alex, for the introduction. 
Um, yeah, so I have um, the pleasure um, to uh, present you the project, the current project I'm uh, working on together with uh, Alex, actually, um, which is related to one specific application context of AI and human rights, which is human recruiting. Um, yeah, and actually we want to really address this yeah, rather normative question, uh, whether AI recruiting should be considered ethical or unethical from a human rights perspective. So why is this um, topic of interest at all? What we can see in practice is that AI tools are entering the recruiting market at exponential rates. And this is further um, emphasized and was even more speeded up through the coronavirus um, that um, really made um, AI interviews, digital interviews, also digital assessments um, even more necessary um, than before. And, obviously even more and more um, easier to implement for, for companies. Um, but to make, first of all, clear what, what we mean uh, when we say AI recruiting tools. So what we can see in practice is that AI recruiting tools can be um, used across the entire um, recruiting process. So already in the outreach stage, for example, when companies um, write um, job ads, AI can be used in order to, for example, word job ads, uh, to debias them, to make them gender neutral in terms of wording, for example. Um, then also in the screening uh, stage, AI tools are used. Um, and actually, this is the stage where algorithms have been used um, already for a couple of years. Yeah? So algorithm, uh, algorithms screen really uh, hundreds, thousands of um, um, uh, CVs, especially for companies, um, for huge comp uh, companies who receive that many um, applications per year um, in order to derive shortlists of candidates that then afterwards can be, um, um, uh, can be assessed yeah, in interviews, for example. Then what is following is um, this assessment stage. So here, um, yeah, this is a stage where it is quite new, um, uh, which is a new field for um, AI tools being used. So um, today's uh, face recognition software, for example, um, is able to analyze um, these sort of yeah, video recordings of um, applicants in order to derive uh, personality profiles or also um, games. Yeah, um, video games are used uh, today. Um, um, in, in, in this uh, stage to also assess and measure um, applicants' um, skills, um, for example. And also the entire facilitation of uh, recruiting and selection um, is um, further enabled through AI um, in, in a lot of companies uh, where, for example, chatbots are used to schedule um, or also to provide um, applicants with fast um, feedback um, loops afterwards. Uh, just to, to make clear uh, what I refer to when I, when I say um, AI recruiting tools. Um, so actually what we can see is that those kind of tools are really entering the market. However, um, recruiting is an application context that is really controversially discussed due to its ethical implications. And what do I mean with this? Um, recruiting decisions have really high impact on people's life as they impact their job, um, their um, where they live, how much they earn. Um, and here it is really the question whether this is ethical to give over this kind of really important decision over uh, to a machine or to an AI when it comes to really an assessment selection um, of a candidate. And probably um, some of you have already heard of um, the, the case at Amazon, I think it was in year 2017, uh, where um, they used um, an AI in the um, selection stage, uh, but it turned out to discriminate against women um, as it was trained uh, based on a really biased data set. So also here's the question, is it really ethical to use so these kind of tools, um, even if it's not like really clear whether they are valid, whether they are not discriminating, um, et cetera. Um, so what we can see is really kind of a contradiction between a really positive image uh, of AI recruiting in practice. We can we see companies are using those tools and also the providers of those kind of softwares, um, of course, are doing the marketing, are saying uh, these tools are the chance and opportunity to reduce human bias and subjectivity in, in the process. But on the other hand, we have also those kind of ethical concerns. And this contradiction uh, really calls for 
a normative assessment of this application context, AI recruiting. And that's why yeah, with our research, yeah, we want to, to address this gap um, by answering the question, is AI recruiting unethical from a human rights perspective? So providing here really um, a normative perspective. And as a starting point um, for this normative assessment, we, we chose um, human rights due to their international acceptance as a normative concept for human behavior. And um, when we combine human rights and our recruiting, on the other hand, we can see or we are referring to three kind of different discourses um, um, here in this context. So first of all, uh, we have the human rights and business discourse that argues that not only states, but also companies are accountable for human rights and therefore also companies who are um, applying or use, using AI recruiting tools. Then we have a discourse on human rights and recruiting. So this call, this course kind of defines practices and standards for recruiting, um, referring to yeah, really different rights on the hand, one hand for companies, but on the other hand, uh, their rights for potential employees and what those are, um, I come to, to this in a minute. And lastly, of course, we, also, we have also the discourse on human rights and AI. And here I'm also referring to the entire AI ethics literature um, and the different uh, ethical principles that were um, established here in order um, yeah, to, to make sure that AI is used in, in an ethical manner. So what we can see that human rights have definitely implications for AI recruiting. Um, and what those really are, um, we tried yeah, to map down um, in this, this kind of table, coming really from some sort of really main underlying human rights that are meeting yeah, the specific properties of AI. Yeah? And those properties of AI might be challenging yeah, for, for, for those underlying human rights in the recruiting co context. And therefore, um, based on this kind of, yeah, challenge or tension, um, we derived certain implications for um, AI recruiting based on human rights. So what are those human rights that are applicable and uh, in the recruiting context? I said, on the one hand, we have some certain rights um, uh, rather on the empl employer side, as for example, the, the right to property. So employers should have the right to um, information to, to find and identify really the best candidate for a certain position. On the other hand, we have rather the rights on the applicant side, as for example, the right to freedom. So individuals should, write, uh, should have the right to choose their own application in the um, selection process, then they should have the right to equality, so meaning the same chances um, for everybody, irrespective of uh, personal attributes. In the process also, there's the right um, to human dignity that um, people and applicants may not conceal all um, information to others um, or conceal information to others, so um, kind of a right to privacy in this process. And also, um, yeah, some, some scholars uh, underline also applicants' right to be told the truth in this, this um, context. So applicants should have the right to know certain selection criteria and should know the kind of rules of the game yeah, in, in, in this application process. And those yeah, kind of underlying human rights, they meet, yeah, as, I, as I said before, those um, yeah, kind of new properties or specific properties of AI. Um, kind of creating this, this kind of tension field as, for example, when we are um, looking at um, the, the topic of privacy, we see that face recognition software have specific properties as it um, can access certain private data, for example, whether um, a woman uh, is pregnant or not, whether people may have some disabilities or not. Um, some things yeah, um, people may uh, not be wanting to tell in, in this sort of uh, application process. Um, and so we have this tension field, but derived then yeah, in order to meet really the underlying human rights, um, um, AI recruiting should um, uh, also enable yeah, the, this concept uh, of privacy. Um, I don't want to yeah, go too much into detail into this table, but what you, you can see here on the slide on the right hand side are in this way uh, the kind of 
five um, ethical principles that we would der derive based on um, human rights discourse um, uh, when it comes to the context of recruiting. So AI recruiting tools should be for sure uh, valid tools, yeah, otherwise it would be even yeah um, not uh, logical at all to use them, but they so they should also yeah, ful fulfill those ethical concepts of autonomy, non-discrimination, uh, privacy, and, and transparency. And actually, so we we've chosen those yeah kind of five ethical principles, um, saying um, yeah those are the ones AI recruiting tools should meet um, in order to be considered ethical from an uh, human rights perspective. So um, yeah, in a kind of normative assessment in, in, in ethical analysis, we are saying that um, yeah, those five criteria should be met, uh, should be met. And so yeah, in a in a paper um, Alex and I are working on, uh, we really are going to detail into each of those questions, um, finding arguments and also counter arguments um, in order to answer the question whether AI recruiting should be per se be considered uh, ethical or um, non-ethical. Um, yeah, this is kind of the structure yeah, of our uh, entire arg uh, argumentation, but also for this yeah, super short um, talk um, I'm, uh, I'm having here, it would be yeah, too much detail. Just like, for example, when we look um, yeah, in the topic of non Okay, so I see that Anna's connection interrupted somehow. You are also not able to hear her, I guess. Okay, let's wait some couple of minutes because she is still uh, locked on. Okay, so Anna, can you hear us? So just wait a minute, I will try to reach her. Okay, so now you're back again. And you can hear me again. Yes, Super sorry. everything is fine. No problem. Um, so I make this 
really short, yeah. And what I just showed you is kind of yeah the argumentation that we um, build up um, in the project we're we are working on. But really, just uh, to conclude, um, so so based on kind of our, our argumentation, how we see the topic, um, we would argue that AI, AI recruiting does not per se uh, conflict with with underlying human rights, but rather that it depends really on the conditions under which AI recruiting tools are used, which are for sure challenging. Uh, uh, but in the um, in the work we're doing, we are yeah, deriving concrete implications for and responsibilities of organization to enforce and realize human rights standards in the context of AI recruiting. But however, yeah, in this context, we argue that also a realistic approach is needed, uh, where not all ethical principles are interpreted in their strictest form, um, but rather an action approach must leave room yeah, also for technical developments, which means, of course, to change tasks for recruiters and also requirements for, for applicants. Uh, but yeah, this, this is um, just, just to conclude how, how, how we would see the topic. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, as I, as I said, it's a, it's a project we're currently still working on. And if you have any thoughts on it, um, um, comments, feedback, um, happy, happy to hear that or any questions. Thanks. Well, thank uh, you. Thanks and sorry for the interruption. No problem, nothing has happened. So thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. So are there questions from the audience concerning Anna's presentation? So otherwise, I would like to ask a short question. So how do you see the overlap on the one side between data protection on the one side and discrimination on the other side? Because I have seen in your presentation that this seems to be quite an important point. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, on this uh, interrelationship between, I would say, two different human rights matters? Mm, and you, you mean um, um, discrimination and privacy? Yes, correct. Mm, but but could could you lay out how how is it for you kind of kind of an overlap or why is it a contradiction okay uh, but, so i mean i mean AI recruiting is for sure a, a topic where where both are important and both need to be addressed absolutely right? but, but probably it's, it's not really a contradiction i would say absolutely so the point i, I was driving to is, is rather the point that if you have for example uh, data protection it means that certain perhaps discriminatory data is not disclosed uh, to to the employer uh, because for example we have information on the status of pregnancy etc uh, so i think this is quite interesting because if you want for example to promote individuals uh, for having a certain status you would also use data privacy but you cannot access the data which you want to basically build upon your own uh, judgment when it comes perhaps to affirmative action uh, so I think this is quite quite an interesting like, mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I'm not in uh, a program uh, yeah, or not a specialist here, but I think also here are kind of different views. Yeah, I think on the one hand, there's the view that um, you need to collect all sort of data to be sure to not discriminate on this certain criteria. Yeah, otherwise you just like leave it open to the AI to decide and then you're not aware. Yeah, I think this is also a kind of a risk. Yeah, uh, On the other hand, exactly, it's, it's what, what you're saying, right? If you are like really um, collecting the data, um, um, then, then you have the issue and the risk of uh, who is using it, who is still storing it. Um, and then we have the, the, um, the problem of pri privacy. Um, so yeah, I mean, complicated um, topic for sure. Um, but here also, um, I think kind of really the, the, the program of you and um, the, the, the validity and to make sure to not discriminate is even the more important, uh, more the, the heavier, more important point here. Absolutely. So, so thank you very much for your words on that. Uh, so Lord, uh, the stage is yours for your next presentation, introducing to us uh, the African uh, point of view when it comes to human rights. So the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Okay, so I would like to share my screen.
Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, it's a mm. yeah. Thank you. So, um, thank you. So, what I present to you is like a comparative analysis of. Professor Florides and Professor Ludges unified framework of the principles for AI in society, in the Ghanaian society, to be precise, a Ghana society. So for the sake of time, I'll just ignore this and move to and start from the unified framework. So, um, so here we used Florida's Unified Framework for an AI in Society, where he analyzed existing sets of framework produced by various notable, reputable or multi-stakeholders, organizations and initiatives. He, he found an overlap between these sets of principles and he grouped these principles into five, which are beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice and explainability. And then we analyze this based on the Ghanaian society, how a Ghanaian society will view the sets of principles in terms of ethics. So um, from that, I'll just give you an overview of what AI is currently being used in Africa. So you know, like most of the population do not have like a formal banking or financial services, but According to the World Bank, 75% of the population have access to mobile phones, which offers like a platform for accessing AI services. Um, so an example is my box, who uses AI to support the delivery of virtual services at, at at least nine countries. I know of nine countries in Africa where AI is they use AI to automate tasks such as credit scoring, fraud detect detection, optimization to keep costs low or to offer micro loans to small businesses, savings, account insurance, transactions. And another company, sorry, another company in Nigeria, um, also called the Chatbox uh, Kudu Loans, um, it's a personal banking which assists and uses natural language to process its users to conduct simple um, financial transactions. They usually use Facebook for that matter to, to do this kind of payment. Um, and also there's also been an increase in entrepreneurship as a result of um, AI. Say so Langboat is a startup in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, who is developing like a gamified AI powered language like teaching chatbots like the early stage um it's an early stage and recently won something a, a startup competition and in pretoria to the el startup called here x group which develops digital tools um on developing in like low cost cell phone connected to otoscope and ai to generate diagnosis of common year disease then it's also um, has an influence on foreign direct investments. Like currently, for I think in 2020, Google set up an AI incubator in Ghana. Um, so since uh, it's an analysis of a Ghanaian society and an European description of ethical AI ethics, we want to know like the origins of the Ghana people, where they are from, and so you have a good understanding of where this is coming from. So it is believed that the Gadangbe people migrated from Israel about the sixth century before Christ and through Egypt and they moved to Ethiopia and later moved to Nigeria. So they stayed in Nigeria for a while and then migrated across different regions in South Africa, in West Africa. So you could find guns in every aspect of West Africa, like in small communities, but they are mostly Stay, they are mostly in Ghana and now um, the capital of the Ghana society sound also the capital of um, Ghana. Um, so on history and cultural relationships. So 
the growth of Accra, which is the Ghana society, was stimulated by the arrival of the Europeans, the first being the Portuguese in the 15th century. And in the 17th century, the English, the Swiss, Danes also established their influence entering into like the coastal trade. Um, Ghana ethnicity was um, constructed out of many strands because of the multiple of trade contacts, religious influence, and intermarriages. So, in an economy in nutshell, say so subsistence living was the first, like, was their way of life before it changed to a more commercial activities. This was because of the advent of Western education um, to the people, to the native in the Ghana society, like clerics trained in missionary schools, men had wide opportunities for unemployment who often travel up country or abroad to help construct colonial buildings in other settlements of the Europeans. Um, so one, for example, like this also has its benefits. So for example, one such Ghana person like Tete Kwashi became famous when he returned from work from abroad. Um, an island called Fernando Po in the late 19th century and he brought back cacao, plant seedings, and, be, and began a plantation in Ghana. This also initiated the transition to dependence on cocoa as an export crop, crop and marked like the 20th century economic history of Ghana to be one of the um, producers, number one producers of cacao. And they also work along the coast, like fishing, also one of their main activities. Um, and since this presentation is a comparative analysis of um, of a Ghana society, so we looked, we considered the ethical principle and social implications of AI from these notable organizations expressed can be also be found in the Ghana outdooring ceremony. Yeah, the Ghana outdooring ceremony, which is called the Pujemo. Pujemo is made up of three words, which is po, which is means yard. J, which is from J, which comes, which means come out or appear. And more is associated with humanity, person, and culture. Therefore, it means to, therefore, Pujemo means is to bring a person or a child or a product out into the yard. Uh, so this ritual is divided into three parts, which showing the child, right? So, or showing the product to the person, like, to the society and benediction, then the community blesses it, like called Jomo. So, and then the society now receives the product of the child. And the focus of this presentation will largely be on the benediction, the second part of the rite, which will provide the foundation of the social implication and application of gun ethics and AI. Let's say. So this is the outdoor in prayer. For the sake of time, I will just give you some few seconds to look at it and move on to the next slides. So strike, strike, may there be peace, strike, strike, may there be peace, strike, strike, may there be peace, may our seats be taken, may our brooms, are. And then it also ends with strike, strike, may there be peace. And uh, so then AI definition and gun ethics. Um, here we use the definition of a strong AI, which refers to intelligence of a machine or a device that has the capacity to understand or learn any intellectual tasks that a human being can. So artificial intelligence is able to conduct fundamental different actions and is able to steadily improve its ability. So on the question whether machines can replace human, guy ethics will definitely answer in the negative. Yeah, um, because of the transhumanistic way of thinking in the Western world, then cogito ego sum, which means I am because I think, which is first or came out from a French philosopher, René Descartes. Um, say, we could say that Ghana ethics also follow the Ubuntu ethics uh, in terms of this uh, philosophy, which is I am because we are. And since we are therefore I am, it's a fundamental opposed to this 
stream of thoughts, which opposed to this stream of thoughts of can machines replace human. Also, secondly, in God ethics, the meaning of life from the living is from the living through other people and connectedness and feeling engaged with others. So a machine will not live through other machines or feel it sympathizes with no one. It certainly does not create any meaning. Um, so AI principles. So we now go back to Florida's and Lutke's unified AI principles under the ethical principles. Say for for beneficent, sorry for the spelling. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, and the beneficence so for AI should be able to improve social benefits and also economic growth. Um, that's what most of this, most of these notable principles pointed out there. Say, and that this this principle is related to the gun in the moral responsibility of the community of the individual. So, which implies so we should develop an AI for the benefit of the whole society. This, in a way that can be found, this can be found in the benediction of the Gan Aldore, which touches on population increases. Yeah, we say, may our seats be taken, may our brooms be taken. We stipulate that human beings are entitled to the benefits of scientific progress. So, another, another case of beneficence is sustainability, as mentioned in Florida's. Um, EGE principles of standard, which presents perhaps that AI technology must be in line with the basic preconditions of life on our planet, say, and continue to um, in the preservation of good environment for future generations. Say, the GA society also touches about this, where it says, like, a GA society should seek to ensure the welfare of individuals by providing for necessities of food, shelter, clothing, say. So in the gun society, the individual not only seeks his own personal interest, but also must also contribute to socialism. The strong, that's the strong helping the weak and the rich enabling the poor to encourage a comfortable material life. And one of, and, and if one should leave the world, he should make sure he left it better than he came to, find it. So that's where it touches like may its bug be fruitful and may some survive that others may come. So in terms of non malificence um, God philosophers develop a similar notion for an inclusive society. So they advance the view that society should expect to see an increase in equality alongside the economic disrupting social unrest, um, and in some cases, political instability with when technology disadvantage and on underrepresented fearing the West if we continue to work out, uh, outside, no respecting the human race. So the point, this point is expressed in the financial access, may, may we respect the world. Um, I will skip the other one and go on for under justice. Under um, justice, it says it talks about social cohesion, like may our circle be intact. So here, the guns also saw that social cohesion of people was imp imperative for the perpetuation of a society. So that's why they say may our circle be intact. This particular in the struggle of life is very important contribution of a gun thinker to the notion of social cause or struggle in general. So moreover, like the idea of social cohesion is a mark of the feeling of class of solidarity and unite and organize people and stimulates definite practical action. Um, then under explainability and Autonomy, I first go to autonomy. And in regards to autonomy for gun society, may we add to it in a in negative way. So this is because AI principle of autonomy emphasizes on individual individuality rather than human control. So 
if it does not refer to the autonomy of a group, for example, like the group determining the purpose of the AI, then they might just react to it in a very negative manner then. And the explainability, um, we talk about equality from the Ghana society because of transparency is required to the entire group. Um, that brings me to um, policies and under and guy ethics. So for guy ethics, policy makers should play an active role in avoiding um in providing measures that allow humans to become a communal person. So public impact assessment bodies should be created to understand the ethical impact of algorithms on the society. And policy makers in developing regions um, should assess the extent to which technology can achieve social and economic solidarity of their citizens. And also tech companies seeking to create techno AI technologies to achieve ethical outcomes should consider the following grand principles, social cohesion, inclusive, protect human dignity, or, and also reduce inequality. So I will conclude by saying, and um, artificial intelligence guidelines mainly come from the West, that's Europe and North America. So applications in Africa uh, do not address most pressing needs of the African continent, which leads to cybersecurity issues and also do not incorporate African ethics. Uh, so what more African ethics have a small role to play in global ethics and philosophy, therefore the risks to be overlooked in the discussion of AI ethics. African ethics like Ubuntu and Ga ethics offers some also relevant development in AI, especially in the rel relatedness rather than the individuality, taking responsibility for society as a whole and embodying true inclusiveness. Um, I will end here and I'm happy to, if you could contribute, it's still a work in progress. So any contribution from you will be very appreciated. Thank you. So thank you too, Lord, for this very interesting approach. And I think also the, the context of relatedness is really important to look at and also to discuss about. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lack of time right now. Um, so I think we will prolong, prolong our section until uh, by five minutes. So I will add five minutes to it. Uh, but nevertheless, we need to process fast because the next uh, panelist, uh, Raphael Max, is already waiting for his uh, contribution, uh, which will then focus on anti-Semitic stereotypes. So Raphael, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for inviting me to talk uh, uh, at your panel. Um, uh, it was a huge pleasure for me uh, when you asked me to contribute to this panel uh, with um, a paper that I've done in the, in the last years with um, Matthias Uhl, a paper that was published this year in September in the Journal of Behavioral and Experimental Finance, actually focusing more on, an, on another topic, meaning on an analog topic. Uh, um, I would like to shed here the light on the normative discourse in financial markets and uh, show you a bias that we found because I think this is also useful for the, um, for the uh, artificial intelligence discourse as we, um, as we see then the, the advantages of artificial intelligence that maybe could rule out uh, such biases that actually we uh, without artificial intelligence just with normal intelligence seem to have uh, especially in Germany. We know that artificial intelligence can bi uh, generate these biases based on a wide variety of factors. We have also a, a panel this afternoon just dedicated to biases. Artificial intelligence is already having a major effect on financial markets and promises uh, many economic and moral benefits. We've also uh, written a paper on this, uh, me and Alex, last uh, year. Uh, but in this uh, study, I want to describe a bias that is related to financial markets and religion. And here is also linked to um, human rights. We all know uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights um, when it talks about uh, the right not to be discriminated on the basis of uh, any um, distinction that doesn't that is not necessary for for the distinction. Let's say some something as uh, race, color, sex, language, uh, or the religion. 
I mean, of course, it can make sense to discriminate in specific aspects uh, with respect to the age or something like this. And in, in, in many constitutions, we, for instance, uh, can only be uh, elected to become president if we have a specific age. But usually we are not uh, discriminated uh, in the Western world with respect to our religion. And this, this paper actually focused on the question whether decisions in financial markets that we are um, making should depend or the more evaluation of these decisions should depend on the um, on the religion uh, that we have so our research question here was is the same investment classified as either ethical or unethical depending on an arbitrary char characteristic of the investor and as i said you an arbitrary characteristic that is not uh, um changing the, the classification of course age here again could be a factor uh, someone that is uh, has a lot of experiences maybe could uh, could have um could make an impact on the classification but gender and religion uh, it should not make an, an, an should not have uh, an impact on the decision whether a uh, decision here in financial markets is moral or immoral. If you buy a specific stock, a derivative in a specific sec um, a second can be uh, classified as ethical or in unethical, but it should not change if it's done by a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, or an ethicist. So this was our research question. And then we focused here on, uh, on, on Jewish, and uh, Jewish um, people, especially in Germany, we all know the, the story. And we said we expected investors uh, with Jewish names, and then I can say some sentences about the names, when uh, there is a possibility in the German language to find out whether someone could be Jewish. Of course, it's just an indicator, it's not a determinant, whether they face more ethical rejection than those with non-Jewish names or local names, let's say. Presumption is based on a century-old accusation against Jewish I do not have to elaborate on this point. It's uh, clear Jews have always been accused of unethical behavior in connection with financial decisions. Let's think about the church rulings by the popes in the 14th, 15th, century, uh, 16th century, or the works uh, of literature when we think uh, about the merchant of uh, Venice and so on. And based on that, we formulated the following hypothesis. Investments of individuals with Jewish names are more often judged unethical than those of individuals with non-Jewish names, meaning that the names, that the religion of the people, the perceived religion, of course, has an impact on the classification. The point is that in, in, in Germany, during the Enlightenment period, in Prussia, uh, many people wanted to give the same rights to everybody uh, with uh, uh, and exactly in the, in the human rights discourse to say that the religion should not exactly discriminate you. And uh, as Jews usually in Germany did not have a surname until that point, they said that everybody, every citizens need a surname to have the same rights. And so first of all, they gave the right to Jewish people to choose their own surname. And later on, they were obliged to take a surname and uh, the families or the, the people, um, they could they choose their name pretty freely. And so usually, the Jewish names are more vivid, let's say, more concrete in the German language, means that many families have chosen a name that was related to their own family, maybe to their profession, and maybe um, uh, uh, related to the, the, the city where they are living. I mean, if you think about uh, the family Goldman, that could be, or I mean, it is in fact like this, but it could be an indicator that they were a German Jewish, a family that traded gold. If you think about a family that had a, a small shop in Frankfurt with a small red seal on their store, they called their uh, family Red Seal, Rothschild. And they were so free to choose their own surname. And th that's the way usually to see in German, it, it, the, the surname could be an indicator for the religion. Nothing more than an indicator, of course, throughout the centuries. Um, and everything is mixing a bit more up, but that could be an indicator. So we've um, measured this uh, with a between subject vignette and describing here an investment decision. And here you see um, name written in capital letters mean here we vary the names. I mean, I would read it out uh, just, uh, let's say, with my own name in this uh, minute. Raphael was born in Munich in 1974. The 45 year old works as an associate in a Munich uh, IT company and so on. Um, here, Raphael's selection of shares focused on an automobile manufacturer or pharmaceutical companies and commodity companies. He will observe this, the shares performance on the smartphone and try to react to strong market movements. Means 
meaning all these things, of course, haven't changed through all the different vignettes, just the names were um, changed. Nothing else, of course, here you can see uh, already that we were triggering a bit, let's say, the, the moral debate in financial markets where um, we are um, investing in commodity companies, in uh, pharmaceutical companies. We, um, we we track the development on the smartphones that could already be some framing uh, effects that of course here we are uh, talking about someone that is maybe a bit more into trading that usually at least in uh, pre-studies uh, usually they are already let's say um uh, labeled as more uh, less and uh, moral um, than someone that is doing a calm long-term uh, investment and later on we just ask a simple question is uh, this person acting moral reprehensible is he acting moral immoral nothing else a Likert scale from strongly disagree to agree and with this we made a so-called let's say ethical uh, scale um, if people said they strongly disagree then we said that okay this is a, a higher level of um, uh, immorality score let's put it like this in a first study, we've chosen these names. Of course, they are all German names. Benjamin Oppenheimer is a German name, as well as Ludwig Huber is a um, German name. And you could wonder why should uh, Adam Scherbaum or Noah Bloomberg should be Jewish names? Is this just uh, made by us? No, of course, we've chosen them from, um, from uh, lexica uh, and uh, name reg um, registrations that I um, used uh, in, in Germany, so Huber Schmidt and Schneider are uh, the top three names. Just Müller is missing uh, of, 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 of in Germany, the surnames. And we ask in the pre-study whether the perception of people uh, is that these names are perceived as Jewish or non-Jewish. And uh, the findings were um, very, very significant. And the names on the right were perceived as non-Jewish, whereas the names on the left were perceived as uh, Jewish. And this was the the outcome. The, we, we sorted the fractions of four and five, so agree and strongly agree, and one and two, so strongly disagree and disagree um, in, in, in two uh, groups. And the fraction of respondents who answered either agree or strongly agree to whether they find the investor behavior more reprehensible is significant higher for German Jewish names meaning that uh, in, in almost 35% uh, uh, of the cases, the people said that the behavior of people with Jewish names were unethical, whereas German non-Jewish just in 15 cases, and usually it was uh, perceived as, as ethical. This was the, the, the finding, and this is actually also the, the main finding then that I wanted to, to present here, of course, um, just for um, completeness and some other data here, we see that exactly the same for uh, every specific name, not just for the group. And we see that even um, the name that was uh, perceived less as less uh, morally reprehensible was even perceived more unethical than Michael Schneider, uh, a name that was perceived uh, non-Jewish. So of course you can wonder why is Michael uh, also an old has Jewish roots. Of course the the name boy was this uh, in 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 the group. Uh, yeah, as, as I said in pre studies, we we checked whether these names were perceived as Jewish or non-Jewish. So this is the finding that we see that um, people in Germany. Of course this was a German panel. It was um, done on Amazon uh, Mturk uh, with just a German. Um, Group. I've read the vignette in English, although, of course, during the um, experiment, everything was written in German. So it was a, it's a German um, population that we checked. And we see that this is actually stable uh, throughout the names. In a control study, or we made several control studies, I'd like just to shed the light on these uh, uh, on this uh, study here right now, we checked also um, other names, whether it's just uh, for German Jewish names or non-Jewish names, because a review in the journal said that maybe it could uh, depend on, on a familiarity bias. So just names that were, that could be, let's say, less fam um, familiar to you could already trigger this effect um, or whether there are other effects. And so we said, okay, I mean, even a British name or an Italian name in this case should then be uh, less familiar and should be, let's say, the, the classical outgroup bias. And we checked for that, and the um, results were uh, 
let's put it like this. I think they were shocking because the Italian names, they were like uh, Francesco Rossi, Alessandro Russo, uh, and Leonardo Ferrari. And the British names were Andrew Smith, David Taylor, and Mark Jones. So here again, just the, the, the three um, most common names that a 45 year old uh, person could have were uh, used uh, in, in, in this panel. And the, the results are here the same that the British and Italian are more or less um, perceived or in the, in the same frame than German John, Jewish names, meaning that we have a specific uh, uh, concrete bias against Jewish people in financial markets. So, and, and with this finding, I would like to conclude this um, this uh, short uh, input here in a between subject we need experiment, we varied whether investors have a German Jewish or German John non Jewish names. Investors with Jewish names were more often judged unethical uh, than others. And it's particularly said that centuries old racial uh, prejudice against Jews seem prevalent in a modern, wealthy, uh, democratic society. And this finding should let us consider uh, the ethical classification of investment in general. And this is another discussion that I'm <clears throat> very happy to face, but probably it's not the, the right session here, whether the moralization of financial markets that we are doing in process right now <clears throat> is um, leading on us in the, in the right direction, um, and that it could be a motivation to consider the effects of prejudice, especially in investment con context in digitized financial markets, meaning um, more anonymized markets and with technical developments that we see right now already um, um, with artificial intelligence in financial markets, I think that there could be a, a positive effect um, and that we can avoid such biases uh, against specific minorities. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Rafa for this very interesting presentation. I also think that the role of historic bias might be quite important given perhaps already existing uh, decision-making perhaps in other areas which might be related to the financial sector, which have been discriminating against Jewish people. So I think this, this is very important as a finding. But as we are running out of time, I would like to introduce you to Nikita, who is also presenting uh, today so that he has enough time for his uh, presentation. As we are already going over time, I think we should uh, focus on his presentation. So Nikita, the stage is yours. We are happy to see your presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you see the presentation? Okay. Um, so, good morning again. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, my name is Nikita and I'm going to present our research that was conducted together with Professor Kamalov. Uh, our title is Methodology of Decision Support Systems for Digital Pub Public Governance. Uh, here is a brief plan of my presentation. So we'll cover key results that we obtained during the research methodology case studies, as well as the discussion section. Um, so to start with, uh, I would like to mention that here we are focusing on a bit different um, essence, but still we are focusing on digital public governance, which is a multi-layer concept that includes hardware and the uh, um, software, the management system, and data processing tools. So key issue here is the capacity to connect all layers and exchange data across data-driven decisions with the aim of mass introduction of decision support systems that can be observed in governments all over the world. So uh, digital public governance seems to be the most obvious area of AI implementation and our concept of decision support systems uh, present a case how it can be implemented in, in practice. Um, so uh, in our research, we consider it uh, four uh, practices of <clears throat> implementation of decision support systems in various countries, focusing particularly on decision support systems for public governance. And here uh, I'm presenting our, the analysis of our results. So we have a certain grouping, a certain clustering of uh, decision support systems in four considered practices. And they were uh, ranked somehow. They were ranked uh, between four categories. Uh, they are uh, conservative informatization, active informatization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Um, so let's uh, cover the methodology. Um, 
So, um, in the context of decision support system, the digital operation center concept is considered as the most comprehensive version of an intelligent decision support systems that is based on big data and AI technologies. It should be noted that such systems should include not only means of collecting and analyzing information, tools for forecasting and modeling development and visual presentation of results in a form of informative for both uh, decision makers and citizens, but also assume somehow automation of the process of providing a range of services responding to the emergencies and threats based on adaptability and machine learning um, technologies. Uh, so uh, here we present uh, the DOC properties in order to better understand what it is in real practice. So DOC properties are comprised of data semantics, big data analysis, Digital twins, the technology where data used to um, prediction and modeling, PPI mon monitoring, and emergency response. Uh, public access, interdisciplinary competence, AI services, which in ensure that DOC works in the context of tasks of digital public governance, and GTA interface, uh, which is government tool, which means that DOC is an infrastructural tool that. Um, is used for various interaction types in the interest of digital public governance. So uh, practice shows that there are currently four main areas of DOC implementation of digital public governance. They are presented in a diagram. Uh, however, such a functional division is um, does not mean that DOC function only in a specific area. There are cases when they perform tasks of all four areas. Uh, and then now um, let's go further to the case studies. So um, there are uh, four countries under the close consideration as global best practices of DOC implementation. They are South Korea, United States, and Estonia. Uh, these particular countries were cho chosen because they were rank ranked highest in uh, the United Nations e-participation index. And uh, now let's focus briefly, just briefly on each case. So uh, in case of Korea, South Korea, particularly in Seoul, DOC takes a form of smart city platform. It was launched in uh, 2017 uh, for work efficiency and transparency of city management for the mayor's use. The main tasks of uh, these um, platforms to provide digital tools for city management, in particular rapid response to emergency situation, monitoring of social economic development and implementation of key performance indicators. And this platform also allows mayor to organize emergency meetings with responsible persons through video calls. Uh, also, this platform ensures uh, government to citizen interaction in terms of disclosure of information about the activities of uh, the government and provision of public services and sometimes consideration of citizens' requests. Uh, considering the practice uh, of United States, it was decided to focus on New York. So New York was the first American city to adopt uh, AI and digital technologies in terms of public governance. And here we're focusing on Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Mm. It has been operating since 2018. And it's not only a software and hardware complex, it's a complex of human resources that is headquarters engaged in providing data management activities based on AI technologies. And they apply strategic analytical thinking to data uh, to help city agencies deliver services more equitably and uh, effectively and to increase operational transparency. Um, so um, Estonia is uh, one of the more developed countries in the field of digital transformation. And uh, this, the practice of this state is distinguished by creation of truly digital society. So the practice of implementing the digital um, operation center uh, here is uh, um, um, will be considered in the framework of an initiative that is called e-Estonia. It's uh, a set of measures for the introduction of um, ICT and digital technologies in public arms and other areas of state development. So within these, the framework of DUC concept, it's uh, necessary to note that 
Um, there is a program e governance, which is a strategic choice for Estonia that aims to improve competitiveness of the country and increase well being of citizens. The aim is to keep the government working seamlessly, uh, and it is supported uh, by a number of initiatives such as government cloud, data embassy, i voting, and e cabinet. Um, then the fourth country is Russia. So here we uh, talk about DOC concept uh, <clears throat> in form of so-called situation centers. So uh, there is a uh, unified state system that was created, a, uh, or system of situation centers that was created in accordance with the president's uh, decree. And uh, the main tasks of uh, such situation centers are informing governors about the situation in order to make operational management decisions, monitoring comprehensive analysis and evaluation of the development of um, social economic processes based on data and relevant authorities, analytical support uh, for decision making, which includes uh, introduce, introduction of AI services, monitoring of operational situation in the field of public security and emergencies, supervision of the implementation of priority projects and monitoring uh, the situation in smaller municipalities. So now let's uh, proceed to the discussion. Uh, so consider the practice uh, of um, digital operation centers implementation uh, testify to the variability of the concept, both in terms of technological structure and main tasks that uh, this essence faces and the uh, so there is a clear correspondence of considered examples to the basic principles of uh, the concept I've uh, already talked about. And the variative part is the implementation areas, as you can see uh, on uh, this diagram. So um, we here we focus on four particular areas of implementation, which are emergency response, data management, decision-making and digital public services. Uh, delivery. Um, so mm, the, the results of uh, conducted case studies confirmed that mm, in countries with high level of e-participation of citizens, uh, DOC is used as a key element of e-government infrastructure. And uh, there is a historical chronology that is traced in the main areas of DOC implementation that reflects various stages of development of the concept in accordance with the requirements for the development of the entire system of public governance. So the chronology is uh, as follows, as you can see on the slide. So um, here are emergency response, decision-making support, data management, and digital public services delivery. Uh, so in conclusion, it's important to note that the given chronology of uh, DOC evolution is not a unified pattern. And in theory, it's assumed that um, DOC follows this chronology, but it's necessary to take into account the peculiarities of public governance in each particular case, as well as the goals and objectives that are set for the DOC. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hope that it was interesting for you and uh, it would be my pleasure to answer the questions that have arisen regarding our research during my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Nikita, for this very interesting presentation because you also show how to utilize dignity, uh, digital technologies um, for human rights. So I think this is a very important point. And I think this kind of overlap between public governance on the one side, artificial intelligence, and then human rights will become a very important uh, field of research. Uh, so thank you very much. And also thank, thank you. Give my thanks to Professor Komolo for uh, also indirectly participating in this sense in our meeting. Um, I think right now we are really running out of time and we are already over time, in fact. Um, so I think um, if there are some questions uh, from uh, the audience, I think they could address it, I think, to all participants. Uh, so I would ask, um, are there some questions uh, for one specific presentation or are there general uh, remarks on uh, AI and human rights uh, within our uh, session? Okay, I see there is a question for a uh, lot.
So it might be that uh, Lord is not here anymore. I'm, I'm here, not... Alex. Okay. <clears throat> um, um, okay, so the question reads, hi, Lord, thank you so much for this very inspiring presentation. What do you think of the new UNESCO global recommendation on AI? ethics from this perspective of Africa. Um, yeah, um, for in my opinion, I've not really had the time to really study the new UNESCO global recommendation. But, um, I've, I've seen the headlines and I think oh, it's it's okay, um, but it doesn't, Africa is made up of different societies. Um, just in Ghana alone, we have about 20 different tribes and they all have their um, ethical principles or ethical way of life or a, a way of life or say, I um, I won't say it covers everything about Africa, but it, 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 it's a start, it's a good start. Yeah, thank you. Hope I answered your question. So is there a further question to one of the participants? Okay, so is there a question of one of the participants to another participant? Okay, I see you all want to make sure that uh, the sessions are running smoothly and in time. Uh, so thank you for all your uh, input. I think it was really a great panel and I think it was really interesting to look at the different perspectives from uh, AI and human rights, because we see that public administration, especially in Nikita's uh, presentation, we have seen that the public administration is really a growing field. And still, I think in the AI discourse is very much uh, dominated by the idea that we have private companies which are using artificial intelligence in a specific uh, way. But I think also the idea of public administration is quite important and uh, tends to be overlooked. So I think there is much potential for further research explicitly in this uh, direction. Also, thank you, Rafael, for your presentation uh, when it comes to uh, stereotypes on uh, anti-Semitism, which are still prevailing in our societies. And I think uh, it is very important not just to look at, uh, I would say, the current discourse we have right now on specific aspects of discrimination, but to have a broader perspective as does might appear specifically, I would say, in areas of finance, uh, perhaps also in areas of health, etc. So I think this might be a bigger topic uh, to look at. Thank also you allowed uh, for your insight into African ethics. And I think also the, the point is that we don't just have Ubuntu as an ethical concept in Africa, but there are also so many more approaches. It's really valuable as you pointed out right now in your answer to the UNESCO approach. So I think there is also much more to look and also future research collaboration. And thank you also, Anna, uh, for your presentation on recruiting and NI, which is such an important field. I think not just in the private sector, but also in the public sector, uh, where it is much more related than to human rights, also to citizen rights, uh, where we, I think we'll have a big uh, discussion still ongoing. Uh, so thank you all so very much, also the audience for the questions. And I'm happy to see you in different contexts uh, soon again. So thank you very much. <laughs>